There's something special about the newspaper, isn't there? Maybe I'm crazy, but I love looking through newspapers, especially old ones. They are such a unique snapshot of regular life. When I look through an old newspaper, I feel as if I'm looking through the diary of an entire community. And if you know where to look, some of the best stories are hiding there in plain sight, just waiting to be discovered. My name is Josh, and this is Obscure History. Do you still read the newspaper? If you don't, please don't feel any shame. You're definitely not alone. Newspaper readership is down at the lowest it has ever been, at least since the 1940s when people started tracking that statistic accurately. Now that's not to say that people aren't reading the news anymore. In fact, if we look at the readership of big papers like the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, there's almost a direct correlation between the dropping sales of print media and the rising sales of digital subscriptions. Something else that I find very interesting is that over the last decade, the number of unique visitors to newspaper websites has grown exponentially. Using that little bit of information, we can infer that as newspapers gravitate towards digital media and become more like a blog, their headlines pull people into specific articles rather than the entire publication. So it seems that in a weird way, people are still reading newspapers more than ever, just not the print version and not all of it. Newspapers used to have a ton of personality. I mean, the first American newspaper was basically like the 1700s version of The Onion. Benjamin Franklin's brother James Franklin started the New England Current to mock one of London's most popular papers, The Spectator. While The Current was mostly composed of shipping reports, it sprinkled in humorous essays, gossip from neighboring towns, and most famously, the letters to the editor, which were frequented by Benjamin Franklin in disguise as Mrs. Silence Duguid a pseudonym he created to better critique society around him. If you're not familiar with the Silence Do Good letters, I really encourage you to check them out. Basically, founding father Benjamin Franklin started writing letters to the editor in his brother's newspaper as the character of Silence Do Good, a perpetual widow with generally bad luck and a snarky attitude. As you can imagine, Silence Do Good was the recipient of many sexist letters from people who were angry that a woman would be so bold as to critique the society in which she lives. In response to one of these letters, Benjamin Franklin wrote this very interesting section, and do remember that he wrote this 200 years before women would be allowed to vote. He writes, I have often thought of it as one of the most barbarous customs in the world, considering us as a civilized and Christian country that we deny the advantages of learning to women. We reproach the sex every day with folly and impertinence. While I am confident, had they the advantages of education equal to us, they would be guilty of less than ourselves. I mean, it's easy to see how the silence do good letters were so sensational. In early colonial America, women were treated like furniture, and here is Mrs. Duguid calling colonial society backwards and barbaric for disallowing women to be as educated as men. It's pretty awesome. And it's one of the things that I most appreciate about old newspapers. They had this certain spark that I don't think I've ever seen in a newspaper that was published during my lifetime. Listen to some of these quotes from historian Charles Warren and tell me if it doesn't just fully encapsulate your feelings about the news today. In describing the language used between newspaper editors about their political opponents, he found phrases like the following, Refuse of nations, yelper of the democratic kennels, vile old wretch, tool of a baboon, my personal favorite, frog-eating, man-eating, blood-drinking cannibals. I mean, that's very strong language for the 1930s. At least we can take refuge in the fact that the news has been hyperpartisan since basically the birth of our country. Maybe our times aren't as special as they feel. Maybe the thing that I love most about old newspapers, though, is that they just reported on, like, literally anything. I recently purchased a subscription to newspapers.com for the show, and I am so stoked about it. This isn't an advertisement or anything, but having access to literally, like, millions and millions of pages of information is going to take my research to the next level, 
It's kind of intimidating, but also awe-inspiring at the same time. For example, I searched for my last name, which is very unique, and in like five seconds I found an article from 1903 that described one of my distant ancestors cheating in a boxing match. Apparently this particular ancestor was a well-known bicycle racer who also dabbled in boxing. They lived in Canada but traveled to Buffalo, New York to fight a local champion, and it did not go very well. Apparently, my ancestor started punching while the fighters were clinched, which was, I guess, against the rules for that fight. I don't even know if that's against the rules for regular boxing, but apparently in this situation it was very illegal and they got disqualified. I was totally amazed to find such an interesting article about my family in just a matter of seconds. And it's not just my family that has interesting stories hidden away in the archives. Before Facebook, people's lives were frozen in newsprint. Everything from boxing matches to people moving into new neighborhoods were captured in those pages. It was the only way to circulate information on a mass scale, so literally anything that publishers thought other people might be interested in made its way into the weekly paper. Were you wondering if Mr. and Mrs. Johnson are back from their vacation to Alaska yet? Well, luckily for you, there's a blurb about it in today's paper. Ever wonder what that weird old man that hangs out by the bus stop thinks about taxes? Good news, he wrote a letter to the editor about it, and now you know. It's funny, the more old newspapers that I go through, the more it really does just seem like a physical copy of Facebook. The information that we can obtain about the past through these publications is absolutely incredible. And for a small fee, we can take a peek into those moments that are just stuck there, frozen in time. Recently, while combing through the archives, I found a story that has completely fascinated me, but before we get into the real juicy stuff, we're going to pause for about 90 seconds to hear from some sponsors, and when we get back, we're going to get into something that I personally find extremely interesting, and I am praying to God that you do as well and that you don't unsubscribe from this show immediately. I am rapidly approaching a level of nerdiness that has yet to be attempted on this show before. This episode was brought to you in part by Squadcast. In 2021, you either have a podcast or you want to have a podcast. And, unless you're an insufferable nerd like I am, you probably want to have a podcast with other people. The challenge is, as we are in a global pandemic, you might not be able to record in person, and we're all completely burnt out on Zoom and Skype. So let me tell you how Squadcast can help solve your problems. Squadcast is a remote content production platform that makes it super easy for podcasters to create high-quality video and audio remotely. You can connect with anyone, anywhere, at any time using their browser-based system. No apps to download, ever. Your video is also saved every 8 seconds to the cloud, so you're never going to lose your recording, and they always have a backup on hand. Your audio is recorded in separate tracks for easy editing, and you can have up to 10 people in a session. So whether your squad is a roving pack of unhinged bachelors, a delegation of girl bosses that take wine tasting a little too seriously, or some loose acquaintances that you've met on Twitter and want to interview for your show, Squadcast has the tools to help you make the content that you want to make. To learn about even more amazing features that Squadcast offers, follow the link in my show notes to squadcast.fm to learn more today. Again, that's squadcast.fm to learn more today. All right, we're back. The year is 1909 in the small town of Columbus, Indiana. There's not much going on, probably never really has been. The railroad's new, but mostly things just keep on keeping on. Kids go to school, stores sell their goods, farmers farm produce. I imagine it's that comfortable static you can find in rural America. It was a warm day, dry air beat down on dusty roads and cornfields. Things were just continuing forth in their perpetual plainness, but on September 7th, 1909, an article in the Evening Republican really had people wound up. 
Among headlines like Dismembered Body Has Been Identified and Burlington Train Ditched in the West was a story that sparked a week-long search. A week of excitement. Honestly, a week of fun in an otherwise bleak landscape. Tuesday, September 7th, 1909. Mysterious man to give away some coin. Will present five dollars to person who asks where were the woodmen founded. Columbus has a mysterious man. He began scouting around this city early this morning and he is going to be here for some time. He carries five dollars in coin of the realm with him and he's going to present that money to somebody who asks him a question. The question is, where were the woodmen founded? The mysterious man is to be used as an advertisement for the Woodman in the Woods pageant to be given here September 17th. In order to arouse interest in that affair, the executive committee in charge of the celebration met last night and selected a man to do the mysterious act. The man is a resident of this city and is well known to many, but aside from that, nothing will be told about him. He will not hide, but will continue about his business and will probably be on the streets every day. To get the five dollars, one must propound the question, where were the woodmen founded to the right man and five plunks will be forthcoming. Now there's a couple of things we need to cover before we get into the search for the Columbus Mystery Man. First, this is a really interesting marketing tactic for a local festival. Placing a seed of doubt in everybody in this tiny little town is pure genius. Maybe the mystery man is your teacher, or maybe he's the mayor. Or maybe he's that guy that just walked by you, or maybe he's somebody that you've never even met before. The possibilities are limitless. Imagine how anxious you would be if you could win prize money for talking to the right person, but you have absolutely no idea who that person might be. It would constantly be in your mind. It is extremely effective marketing. Second, we need to know that $5 in 1909 would have been over $100 today easily. In fact, the official inflation calculator only goes back to 1913, but it says that it actually would have been around $130. That's awesome. I would totally roam around town asking random people cryptic questions for the chance to win $130. Without contextualizing the prize, it seems a little weird for people to be so excited about it, but once we realize that they were actually competing for over $100, it makes way more sense. Third, we need to talk about the Woodman. I believe that this article is speaking about the modern Woodmen of America, which was a fraternal group kind of like the Shriners or Lions Club. It's one of those organizations that seems really nefarious for some reason, but is actually just a bunch of half-retired people that want to continue socializing and helping their community. The modern Woodmen of America was founded by Joseph Cullen Root on January 5th, 1883 in Lyons, Iowa. Root was a very well-known and successful businessman with many ventures. He was also a member of other fraternal organizations throughout the years. After enjoying his time with these organizations, he decided that he wanted to create one all on his own. And thus, the modern Woodman of America was born. Legend has it that during a Sunday sermon, Root heard the pastor tell a parable about pioneer woodmen clearing away forests to build homes and offer security for their community, He adopted the term Woodman for this organization. To complete the name, he added modern to reflect the need to stay current, and of America to symbolize patriotism. The Woodman had a very particular set of membership rules. The group was open to members of basically any religion. However, until the mid-1900s, membership was restricted to white males between the ages of 18 to 45 from the 12 healthiest states. Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, the Dakotas, Nebraska, and Kansas. Residents of large cities were also disqualified for membership, as were those employed in certain professions, such as railway workers, underground miners, gunpowder factory employees, liquor wholesalers and manufacturers, saloon keepers, aeronauts, sailors of the lakes, seas, and rivers, and professional baseball players. So we've got this very exciting competition being sponsored by a philanthropic fraternal society. That's interesting enough. But it gets even juicier, because the mystery man began using the newspaper to taunt those who were searching for him. The next day we have this entry. 
Wednesday, September 8, 1909. The mysterious man who is to give five dollars to the man or woman who asks him the question, where were the woodmen founded, is enjoying life and is chuckling over the fact that while numerous men are being asked the question, nobody has asked him. He was seen this morning sitting on his porch where he peacefully smoked a pipe and read about the woodmen in the woods and the Republican. He certainly was having the time of his life, because he could not have read the Republican and been anything but pleased. So the competition began to heat up after the mysterious man began taunting the people of Columbus. One day later, on September 9th, we have this entry. Thursday, September 9th, 1909. The mysterious man who is to give five dollars to the person who asks him the question, where was the woodman founded, went to the state fair today. He is said to have been seen boarding an interurban can, and he had a copy of the Republican in his hand. Grant Finch knows him but of course he refuses to give the snap away. Last night the mysterious man was downtown with the crowds and he heard a great many people asking the five dollar question, but not one of them addressed the question to him. The mysterious man was quiet on the 10th, but on the 11th he stepped up the game a bit. Rather than taunting the people of Columbus, the mysterious man actually began to tell them where he would be. We have the first of these articles on the 11th. Saturday, September 11th, 1909. The mysterious man who is to give five dollars to the person who asks him where was the woodman founded will be on the streets tonight. It is said that he will be on the corner of 5th and Washington streets when the new Maxwell runabout to be given to the winner of the Forest Queen Festival is run up and down the street. And as an additional hint to the mysterious man, it is said that he will have a copy of the Republican in his pocket. Again, the mysterious man went silent the following day, but on the 13th, the political cartoon on the cover page of the Republican, which generally dealt with very serious issues, depicted a mob of people strip-searching a gentleman while they shouted, Where was the woodman founded? Unfortunately for the cartoon Columbians, the man wasn't their mystery man, and the cartoon people were left without their cartoon five dollars. While the political cartoon on the cover was certainly exciting, The more interesting bit is actually found on page 5 of the September 13th issue. The mysterious man is getting more confident and is giving more information away. Monday, September 13th, 1909. Mysterious man talks. The mysterious man says, Tonight, between the hours of 7 and 9 o'clock, I will mingle with the crowds on Washington Street between 7th and 3rd Streets. I will immediately present to the person asking me the question, where was the woodman founded, a $5 bill. I am not too tall, and I am not too short. I am not what you would call handsome, although I am far from being ugly. I am very popular, especially with the women. They are all after me. That is, after me to save coupons from the evening Republican and to vote for their babies. I would need to take a hundred subscriptions to supply the demand. It is rather amusing to me to have people pass me on the street and say, I'll bet that's the mysterious man. It makes me rather nervous, but why don't they ask me the question if they want the $5 bill? I sometimes take a drink at the firehouse pump, and Bill Hendricks always looks at me like he thought I had the five, but he never asks. Last night I stepped into the Greeks and took a chair at a table on the south side halfway in the back. A young man and his best lady friend sat close by and eyed me curiously. I heard her whisper, I'll bet that's the mysterious man. But why didn't they ask me the question? The young fellow wouldn't have been out so much money if I had handed her the five dollar bill. Look for me on Washington Street tonight. I will not stand still very long, but you can find me easy. I must go home promptly at nine o'clock. Very truly yours, the mysterious man. I think that at this point, the people of Columbus must have thought that this little game, which started as a small column and grew to a daily cover story, was a complete hoax. How is it possible that despite advertising their whereabouts and schedule, nobody won the five dollars? I feel like I would have given up, but the people of Columbus didn't, and the mysterious man gave away a ton of information on the 15th. Wednesday, September 15th, 1909. Clue is now given to Mysterious Man. He will be at Wet's Grocery tonight. If caught, another man will be named in his place. The Mysterious Man says, Well, you haven't got me yet. Some of you came pretty close to it Monday night, but why didn't you ask me where was the woodman founded? Grinning at me and winking the other eye didn't get the five dollars. 
I thought when Frank Lowe peeped out the drugstore the other evening that he had me for sure, but he forgot to ask me the question. The young lady that asked me who started the woodman no doubt meant well, but got a little twisted on the question. Charlie Show glanced up and spoke to me Monday evening as I crossed the railroad track at 5th and Washington, but didn't ask me the question that would have made him $5 richer. I passed Bert Dennison and Charles Setzer, who were discussing Colorado and Arkansas lands, but they were so busy with that that they neglected making $5 on the spur of the moment. Roy Emig has the political handshake which he always carries with him. That gets votes all right, Roy, but if you want the $5 bill, you can't get it talking ginseng and politics. Now, my friends, I am going to tell you where I am, but not who I am. In the first place, I will say who I am not. I don't belong to the woodmen, but expect to in the near future. Now, here is where you can get me tonight. Listen, I will make my appearance in the store of that enterprising grocer, Mr. Will Wetz, tonight between the hours of 8 and 10 o'clock. The first person asking me the question, where was the woodman founded, will at once receive the promised $5 bill. And not only that, but Billy Wentz will also give the lucky one an order for a dollar's worth of groceries. I like to trade at Wetz's where you can find anything you want in the grocery line, and everything is kept so clean, neat, and attractive. Say, have you tried some of those delicious peaches that he got today? Better hurry tonight and get some of those also. But you'll get me tonight too, and come early. Now I will not roam about the streets tonight, but I intend on going to the Wet's grocery store during the time mentioned, and I will surely be caught there. It makes me somewhat nervous, but I think I'll be able for the undertaking. But please don't track me with bloodhounds. Determined to capture their mystery man and claim their five dollars, the good people of Columbus descended upon Wentz Grocery, and they finally solved their mystery. Thursday, September 16th, 1909. Willie Strawn was mysterious man. Two people asked him Woodman question, but they could not accept the five dollar bill. The mysterious man has been found, but strange to say, he still has the five dollars which was to be given to the person who asked him the question, where was the woodman founded? The mysterious man was Will E. Strawn, who conducts a boarding house at 6th and Mechanic Streets, and he was not captured until last night. A lengthy story in this paper yesterday said the man would be at the Wet's Grocery between the hours of 8 and 10, and all during that time a number of people waited on the sidewalk asking every person who entered the store where the woodman was founded. The store was crowded all evening, and finally when ten o'clock approached, Mr. Strawn entered. Mrs. James J. Lash asked the question, and the mysterious man handed over a five-dollar bill. However, Mr. Lash is a member of the woodman, and he would not consent to his wife keeping the money. As Mr. Strawn started to leave the store by the rear door, he encountered Dwight Wetz, who asked the question, and he in turn was offered the money. But as he has an office in the Wetz grocery, he did not feel like keeping the money and returned it to Mr. Strawn. So although the man was found, the money was not paid to anyone. So there we have it. Will E. Strawn was the mystery man, but who was Will E. Strawn? Exhausting every resource at my disposal, I've been able to put together some details about the Columbus Mystery Man. While I can't exactly nail down where he was born, I do know that he was married in September of 1896 to a woman named Emma Dow. Their wedding took place in Wisconsin. I know that he was part of some real estate litigation in November of 1897 in Kansas, in what appears to be some contesting of property left to their family in a will. I also know that he was a passionate leader. He wrote an incredibly sincere letter to many people who he had been involved with in the club, urging them to attend a reunion so they could rekindle their friendships. He was also the manager of West Percolator Company, and it seems as if he traveled throughout the Midwest selling coffee makers. He was also a member of various philanthropic organizations and fraternal clubs, similar to the Woodmen or the Shriners. I also know that in 1902 he contracted malarial fever and was hospitalized. He eventually recovered, but only a few years later in 1911 he would succumb to an unspecified illness. Now I can't say that Will E. Strawn did anything world-changing. In fact, I don't know very much about him at all, honestly. But I could say that everything that I did find about him 
pointed towards someone who was incredibly sincere, passionate about leadership, dedicated to the church, and was a servant to their communities. I find these stories particularly moving. There are people in our everyday lives who are just like Will E. Strong. Every community has a sincere leader or a dedicated servant or a benevolent philanthropist. They're the people that hold communities together. Maybe they get their due thanks, but it all too often seems as if it goes completely unnoticed by history. Just because they didn't do anything significant to further the prospects of the country or make groundbreaking progress in the name of science doesn't mean that they were insignificant. To close out, I want to read Will E. Strawn's obituary just to give you a sense of how well-respected he was in his little part of the world. Saturday, April 8th, 1911. Will E. Strawn, age 48, is dead, hereafter an illness lasting three years. He formerly lived at Montpelier. His body was taken there today. Strawn was cheered to the end by a printed resolution which hung where he could always read it. His resolution read, Just to be patient. Just to be humble. Just to be submissive and not complain. Just to keep a cheerful, thankful heart just to claim all the gospel promises, and to commit to memory all of them that I don't already know, just to repeat very often the deathless truths and weave them into the web of life. All right, everybody, we have reached the end of this episode. Thank you so much for putting up with how nerdy I am. I genuinely loved doing that research. If any descendants of Mr. Strawn ever listen to this, I would love to hear from you to find out more about your ancestor. Um, It's kind of strange, like, uh, getting access to millions of pages of newsprint has kind of changed my outlook for this show in a weird way. Um, Just doing, like, a brief search for, like, wild keywords has led me to some of the absolute most insane stories i have ever read in my life and i am so pumped to bring them to you this show is only getting weirder and more obscure by the day (laughs) Uh, i'll try to mix in some things that are maybe a little bit more mainstream than a a philanthropic festival from (laughs) the early 1900s in a city that had like less than 20,000 people in it. That is the most obscure thing that I've ever spent time researching. But honestly, it's so interesting to me to get a snapshot of these people's lives. So basically, I don't even know how I found this particular event. Um, But I saw the headline. uh, I think that the keyword was like mysterious man or something. So I saw the headline, I opened it up, and then I backtracked through like, months of the of that newspaper and i found every reference to it that i could uh then once i found that it was willie strawn i started searching for him as a keyword and i found some things from earlier in his life and then i found his obituary and it's so strange to me that like in a pre-facebook world it was just like that's all that you had it's it's really mind-boggling because i found Uh, a couple of different articles about him and his wife moving into new neighborhoods so you could almost draw like a map of his life from like place to place to place and like um in a couple of these little columns where he was like either coming to or leaving a neighborhood people called him the percolator man which i thought was awesome (laughs) i honestly could go on for so long about this random guy's life who you can't find on google i don't have any pictures of him he is as real to history as eventually someday I will be, except for there'll probably be more pictures of me because I live in the digital age and he didn't. <laughs> but, um, it, it's it's incredible to me. And I hope that I can pepper in some of these stories where I'm bringing to light the everyday people that sort of um, were interesting and important parts of their communities, because it is fun to do history about, you know, uh, like big topics from a perspective that maybe you didn't realize before, or maybe like, uh, like I think about the agent three fifty five episode, like that's a big topic. Like everybody kind of knows Benedict Arnold, but here's kind of the spin on it that maybe you didn't know about before, but this is legitimately like nobody knows about this story except for you and me. <laughs> and I think that's a really interesting exclusive club to be in. So Obscure history is just getting more obscure, and guys, I honestly, 
I have to like hold in my excitement because some of the stories that I've been finding flipping through these newsprints are so crazy. <laughs> okay, I've rambled on for way too long. I am so far over the limit, but I just I really enjoyed this story. Doing the research was so fun. All right, so just a couple of quick announcements. Um, in the show notes, you will find a link to the merch store. I think for the rest of this week. You can get free shipping if you use the code FREESHIP821. There will be a prompt on the website if you choose to visit it. If you do, I would be very appreciative. As always, a portion of my proceeds goes to support UNICEF because kids in the world do not have easy lives all the time, and they should. Uh, Also, I don't get to set the pricing, I don't think, since I'm supporting uh, a charity. At least I wasn't given the option, so sorry that things are expensive but a portion of that goes to unicef also if somebody buys a skateboard with the show logo on it and takes a video of themselves doing a kickflip i swear i will let you choose two episode topics in a row i will advertise whatever you want for like a month (laughs) i want to see that so bad so please consider that if you're a skateboarder and you can do a kickflip i am not a skateboarder and i cannot do a kickflip so i am envious of your skills if you are Okay, so taking us out today with their song Welcome to Right Now is Charity Bliss. This track is really, really interesting for a couple of reasons. So it's got kind of like an 80s pop sort of vibe, not quite synth wave. It's not quite like indie rock, but like maybe some emo inspired vocal melodies. I don't know, really cool mixture of things. It makes me feel like I want to go play like, um, like, uh, Super Mario, like tennis in like a basement on like a GameCube. (laughs) I think that that's what it's meant to do. And it's really great. Uh, so I'm going to link some of their stuff down below in the show notes. Um, and I got to get out of here, guys. This has been a long episode, and it is currently 1.30 in the morning. So I will talk to you later. You guys have a nice day, week, I don't know. <laughs>